So we can sing a song or we can just start preaching. I don't care. <clears throat> okay, who's, uh, who's running the camera? Are we on yet? We're on. Okay. <clears throat> well, it is good to have you this evening here at Bible Baptist Church, and we appreciate you coming out. Been a beautiful day, hasn't it? Uh, almost like we're actually going to have a fall this year, which we usually don't. We go straight from summer to winter. Uh, but it has been such, pl such a pleasant uh, morning. Please remember to pray for those of our church that's sick. The Brother Hastings family are uh, still in quarantine. Our piano player has been exposed again, I believe, probably through the school system and is uh, quarantined now. She's got to have another COVID test to see if she's going to be positive or negative. But that's going to take uh, maybe probably even through Sunday. Uh, so uh, uh, things are a little bit... Uh, sparse right now, so keep all of our church families in prayer, uh, and uh, we will go ahead and ask you to turn over with us to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. We are studying out of the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we want to continue our, our lesson there. We're in chapter 6, uh, studying on the model prayer uh, that the Lord uh, gave for uh, His disciples. Uh, 9 and we're going to read those verses real quickly. It's the model prayer. You're familiar with it. So uh, just read with me uh, on verse 9. It says, And after this manner therefore pray ye our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You remember this is a model prayer uh, and is giving instructions to the disciples as well as to any believer uh, in what or how to formulate a prayer, how to uh, have a proper uh, testimony of prayer that God might be honored and glorified when we come boldly into his throne room and that we approach him uh, uh, in the way that he should be approached. Uh, and he says here in verses 9, after this manner pray ye. Uh, and so he wants us to understand uh, the formatting, I think, is very important to know that. Uh, this prayer is not the Lord's Prayer, as we said earlier. That's in John 17, uh, but it's a model prayer. Uh, and remember, he uh, rebukes us or encourages us not to pray as the heathens pray. Uh, uh, and so this prayer ought not to be just a, a grouping of words that we say uh, with some religious connotation to them. Uh, but if they're said from the heart and if they're said uh, uh, to glorify God and they're said with meaning with them, uh, then that, that's a good prayer. You can use it any time because it is a well-formulated prayer. Uh, amen. And so uh, we have started on this prayer. And you remember we have uh, last week we talked about what prayer was, communicate, communicating to God, communicating with God from a heart, from, a, uh, uh, from an attitude of yielding to His will uh, and uh, honoring Him when we pray. And then we had found that uh, our Father rules from heaven. That was an interesting, I thought, point. It says uh, in verses 9, uh, after this manner, therefore, pray our Father, which are in heaven. We talked about uh, the relationship of fatherhood, and then we talked about how that our, our God rules from heaven. And I was thinking about that. I know we've already touched on it, but I thought I would do one more thing, and I'll do it quickly if I can. Uh, but when it talks about our God being from heaven, we understand uh, uh, from John being called up to the third heaven that that's the place where God dwells. But when we talk about this prayer and the exalting of who God is from, a, uh, from his heavenly position, uh, it's a superior and a reigning position. He's sitting on the very throne, the pinnacle of all creation. For the Bible tells us uh, that God in seven days uh, uh, spoke all of creation, arranged all of creation, put everything in its place, and now he rules over it. He sustains it. He is the uh, one and only God. He's the only authority. He is uh, high and lifted up. Ezekiel saw it. He said, I see God high and lifted up. And that's what God is. And when we think about him ruling from heaven, not only it is the place where his throne is, but it's a place he created. Uh, he, the Bible tells me uh, that God created uh, heaven for those who believe in him. Our access or our doorway that we might spend eternity in God's heaven is Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, uh, and so he's our access into this place that God created uh, for his believers, uh, uh, for those who have 
uh, trusted him. And so we find uh, that as we're praying, we're exalting uh, the personage of God and the work of God and the grace of God, uh, all in the beginning of this prayer. In fact, as I will say to you uh, a little bit later in, in our... that decision he is holy amen and I heard somebody say well now wait a minute uh, if you make a mistake does that mean you're not holy somebody say yes or no my wife thinks I make mistakes all the time amen uh, uh, so I would you know if you have somebody that makes mistakes it, well let me give you an illustration have you ever made a mistake in your checkbook 
Really? Okay. And let me ask you this. When your bank statement comes in, do you just kind of, now maybe you do them online, I don't know, but bear with me, I'm an old style. I still do my books by the, the, uh, by the bank statement. I go through and check them all out. But when mine comes in, I know that I don't, know, I don't make a mistake. So I just take that thing and pitch it over in the corner. And I never look at it again because I know my checkbook exactly right. I wish I could tell you what my checkbook looked like last month. It was not pretty. And I'll tell you, after I got through figuring it, I found a mistake in it. And, and I actually had to take, uh, go to my savings, my reserve, take out $100 and go to the bank and put it into my account to cover the mistake I made in the bank. I found out real quickly, I'm not perfect. I have error in me. And a, and a failure uh, uh, to be perfect will cause a failure in holiness where God is concerned. So God does not sin, but here's what I heard. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, there's a controversial point in Genesis chapter 3 that has to do with the integrity of God, the mistake-proofness, if we might use that word, if that's a real word, of God. For in Genesis chapter 3, uh, the Bible says... It repented God that he had created man. Someone said, well, does that not mean he made a mistake? Do you know every time somebody tells you that God can save you and then he will take that salvation away from you means he made a mistake? God who has supposed to know all things, know the beginning from the ends, know that nothing is surprises him at all. He's going to come in and save you, write your name down in the Lamb's book, and somewhere along the way, for whatever the reasoning, you're going to lose your salvation. God made a mistake. Okay, in Genesis, he said it repented God, amen? God does not repent as men repents. The word repent first and primarily means to turn. Now we understand repentance means to turn from wickedness to holiness, that's repentance. To turn from evil, to turn to good. But God is good. His holiness is declared without sin. He has no sin, he has nothing to turn away from. So then when it talks about it repenting God, it just means that God's changing his dealings with men from grace and mercy to judgment. And at the end of the flood, when Adam comes off of the ark, Adam, when Noah comes off of the ark and builds an altar, God again turns, and he could have put, written it right in there, that God now turns from judgment to grace. And so, and he shows uh, Noah and his family grace, they go out and begin to populate the world. So when we talk about uh, uh, God's holiness, it's an infinite, infinite holiness. It's a holiness without any failure, without any weakness, without any sin, any activity of evil, and without even the uh, a suggestion of a mistake or an error in judgment. We can say this, God's holiness declares his perfection. Amen. Amen. The holiness of God uh, declares that uh, he does all things uh, without mistake. He does all things uh, uh, to which his holiness, there, and I don't mean to create this as, a, as something is a contradiction, but his, his holiness agrees, his holiness agrees with God. Does that make sense? God is holy and his holiness is intact. Amen. When we consider God as holy, there are two or three things that we need to uh, really understand about that holiness. Number one, and I think we forget this, God's name is holy. Amen. Amen. God's name is holy. Uh, when we use the name of God, we are speaking uh, uh, about that creator, that one who has no uh, error, that God, that one who sits on the pinnacle of time and creation, on the pinnacle of eternity. He is, he is, uh, uh, he is a holy God, is he not? And his name uh, uh, is, is holy. Israel thought that the name of God was so holy that they wouldn't even speak it. Uh, they uh, would speak other, but they didn't want to speak his name because his name was so holy. Remember what Isaiah said? I'm a man of unclean lips amongst uh, a men of unclean lips. And that when, the, when God's name is uttered, it should not be uttered by men with unclean lips because his holiness is in his name. Amen. And so when we find that, then uh, his name is uh, uh, before and uh, over, I guess, uh, all things. Uh, we talk about the name of Jesus. Isn't that a precious name? Amen. The Bible says there's no other name uh, given under heaven whereby men should be saved. 
Amen. His name is, is special. It's precious. Uh, in fact, when the, uh, the prophecy of the virgin was given, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And God himself named that son, said he shall be named Emmanuel, which means uh, God with us. Emmanuel, Jesus, same name. Uh, so the name was just ordained by God, and that is a holy name. But let me remember or remind you that there is a Godhead in heaven, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. We identify them in separate entities, but collectively they are uh, the one and only Holy God. And when we talk about the name of God as being holy, His name was holy and is holy uh, before there was a Jesus ever born before the name of Jesus was ever uh, uttered by men or by prophecy. There was a holiness that dwelt in heaven and, is, and he is God Almighty. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Elohim that's spoken of in, in Genesis. Uh, Elohim means three or more. Uh, and so that one that was there, that preexisted time, that preexisted creation, he is a holy God and his name uh, uh, is uh, to be dealt with in an honorable way. Amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, we find that when uh, men dishonor the name of God, God takes that very seriously. Amen. When we take the name of God in vain, we call that profanity. And sometimes, if even we believers, sometimes we use bywords and different words that uh, we actually uh, on, I honestly do believe. Sometimes we may even in, not intend to do so. Uh, and sometimes I think we do intend to do so. But we use God's name without purpose or meaning. We just throw it out, you know, uh, which is to misuse God's name. Now, there's a difference between profaning the name of God and using what we in society call profanity. Okay? Profanity is generally words that society for that period of time has uh, made to be ugly words. Amen? Amen. And we're not going to talk about what they are. You know what they are. I'm not going to give you any examples of that. Uh, but there's a big difference between the profanity of our language, those, those words that, kind of, uh, that bring a connotation of, uh, of ugliness or just rudeness, uh, and all, all men use them. Uh, uh, there's a difference between that and cursing by the name of God, profaning the name of God, using the name of God wrongly or without reason. Amen. Uh, for instance, we have uh, one of the most common words that men use uh, uh, that are not saved, and I hope Christians don't, is to take God's name and, and, and uh, make a compound word uh, and take God's name and connect it to a place called hell. Amen? Uh, and, and do you understand what you do when you use that word? You're invoking the great creator, he who has the power to create heaven and earth sets on all of eternity and you're asking him to do something that in within his own will he came and sent his son to die to stop from happening. That being men going to hell. That's taking God's name in vain. Using it unwisely. Using it in a way he does not allow us to use it. That's profanity. Amen. God takes that very, very seriously. Amen. And so uh, the Bible says here uh, in the verse 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy, holy is your name. Remember, that's what the angels cry. Uh, holy, holy, holy. Uh, as they go through heaven, those angels with the six wings, you remember them? Uh, and they're crying, holy, holy, holy. How, how often do you think? And I know this is uh, something we really can't answer because none of us have been there to come back and give the, a report from it. But how many times do you suppose in heaven that holiness is going to be mentioned? Think there might be a few? I think it might be on our lips frequently when we are dwelling there with a uh, most righteous God. Amen. We pray. Uh, uh, first then we pray for God uh, uh, to be holy, for God's name to be uh, lifted up uh, as Savior and as our, uh, as our, not just our companion, but our King. Everything that we deal with God, I believe honestly, folks, ought to be recognized within the framework of God being holy and all promises in the Bible, all promises in the Bible are bordered by the holiness of God who can not lie. Amen. And when we pray, hallowed be thy name, honestly, I think when we pray for God's holiness uh, uh, and we being the children of God, we ought to also be setting a standard for our behavior. 
This is what Jesus said. It's a simple little phrase. You hear it said so many times, but how true it is. Be ye holy. You be what I am. Be ye holy. Why? Is it fun? It's, not con it's not compatible to the world. It's not compatible to what we see daily. It's not compatible to our election system. It's not compatible to our banking. It's not compatible to anything men does. Be ye holy. You have an example of that? Yeah, him. Be ye holy because I am holy. So if I want to know what holiness is, I'm not going to look at him. And I hope he's not looking back at me. Because you will not find holiness in me you will find God's grace in me to forgive me when I fail. You'll find God's love in me as I try to demonstrate his, uh, his grace toward men. But I'm telling you right up front, uh, uh, I'm still a sinner saved by grace and I'll be nothing better than that until I get to heaven and this corruption's put on incorruption. And that happens by the grace of God as well, amen? And so uh, there is this thing of the holiness of the name of God and that we should reflect that holiness, amen? Understand that the very reason that Jesus came to the earth was to glorify God. People say, wait a minute, I thought he came to save men. The glory of God is revealed in its greatest testimony at Calvary. Let me read a couple of things with you. God, uh, in Psalms 46, 10, says this, Be still and know that I am God, and I will exalt among the heathen. I will be exalted in all the earth. His name will be uplifted. And we also know Philippians 2, 10, that says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every mouth will confess that he's the Lord of all to the praise and honor of God. Amen. And so God is glorified. God is the uh, or came, or Jesus came into this world to finish and to do the work of God and to glorify God. Jesus said, Father, uh, uh, glorify me in you and glorify you in me. Amen? So that what he did at Calvary was the very intent and purpose of God and God's holiness, folks, is the mediator of if I dare use that word, of the grace of God. God's holiness saw man as wicked and would not leave them in sin, but desired that they might be reconciled to him in holiness. When he made that sacrifice in the, in the, in the book of Genesis and, and took the lamb skin and covered uh, Adam uh, uh, and Eve with it that they might come back in before him, what he was doing was he was allowing Adam and Eve to come back into a place that they ought not to ever have been able to come back to. That's into his holiness. Because his holiness hates sin. Amen? And I plead, and you know this and, and as well, we cannot come before God as we are because God cannot receive us as we are because we are sinners. And if God loved you, and he does, uh, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, amen, uh, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the whole world and gave an opportunity for all to be saved, but all are not saved, okay? But when that salvation is achieved, it brings me, according to John chapter 1, into a relationship of being the Son of God, but it does more. It now opens for me the very presence of God. It allows me who was bought by sin, who has lived, was born in sin, who has walked in sin, and is still even today a sinner, <clears throat> to come into the holiness of God. Without that, uh, and by the way, Hebrews says that Jesus' body is the very veil by which we are uh, secured uh, from God's holy judgment. We are behind or wrapped in that body of Christ and when he sees us, he sees us perfect. Because otherwise, let me tell you something, if, if you were standing before God, and let's just say like a, a mother and a child, if you watch uh, uh, Preston, every once in a while, Preston, Preston likes everybody. But every once in a while, Preston gets a little bit, uh, what shall we say, a little bit uh, where he acts like he's timid and acts like he doesn't uh, want to, you know, he'll get behind his mama's skirt and hide. 
He was doing that the other day. He'd get behind his mama's skirt and hide, and then he'd do like this. And he'd look out. Do you know what happens if you look out from behind Jesus Christ? And God peers upon you without that veil, which is Christ, that, can, that covers you totally. He's, his holiness will become active. His holiness was active. You understand when Jesus was on the cross, it was God's holiness that was being uh, appeased, that was being dealt with because God hates sin and, and Jesus was paying the price for sin that he might veil us and God might see us as holy. Amen? Amen. So that uh, we understand, he says, uh, hallowed be thy name, holy is their name. Uplift his name. Holy is his name. We ought to understand that uh, a, a lot. Amen. A family, uh, to see the value of what this holiness is, uh, has to consider our history, has to consider our bloodline, has to consider possibly our future. And we all have somewhat of a pride, I guess. I don't mean that in an ugly way. A proud, a pride for our family name. Amen. Uh, we, we're proud to be who we are in our family. Uh, and the, the truth of the matter is most of us, if we had to go back and start investigating our family, uh, we probably wouldn't be very proud very long. Amen. I, I honestly think, and, and I'm going to get, I hope I don't get letters about this, but some of this ancestry.com do you know you couldn't sell that stuff if you investigated people's ancestry and actually told them what was there? I'm not saying that what they tell you, you got an uncle that he was a senator. You might have. But what about that horse thief over there they didn't tell you about? You see what I'm saying? You can't sell uh, to the public these things if when you give them your bloodline, they begin to show you all the negativism that's in your blood and in your history and in your family. Uh, uh, and by the way, will be in your future. Amen. Remember the father that had two sons? One of them was a prodigal son. Amen. I'm glad God put in his Bible the good and the bad. Amen. I look at the bloodline of Adam and I can tell you it isn't good. Amen. Till Jesus comes out of it. Amen. So that when we look at this uh, bloodline and we see the, the past and the present and the future, I can tell you it doesn't look good. We all have bad stuff. Sometimes, you know, you can raise children. You can raise four or five children. Nowadays, one or two children. One of them will be awesome, and the other one won't be worth shooting. But you do understand, both of them's in your heritage. Both of them's in your bloodline. Amen. If we had to take a vote, uh, uh, and, and I hope we don't ever have to do this, that collectively we can come up with holiness. From where? From who? Well, can I tell you this? As a church, collectively, we can come up with holiness. We can come up with it in Jesus because his name is holy. Amen? <clears throat> Consider this, and then I'm... Have I already been preaching a half an hour? Wow, hold on. I want to give you this. He says in verses 9, And after this manner, therefore, pray, uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just take and underline this one little word. It's sitting right there. Hallow be. And that's not a bumblebee. Uh, that's not somebody buzzing around. Hallow be. That little word indicates a restriction against failure. Amen? Hallow be. Uh, I'm trying to think of a word, and I can't think of an illustration. I had one earlier, and I forgot what it was. That happens when you get old. But it's a perpetual, hallow be thy name. I, I watched a uh, science fiction movie the other day. I don't even remember the name of it. And I was sleeping through most of it, but I picked up on some of it. You know, when you get in your recliner at night, you nap. I do at least. Uh, my wife, she'll get in that recliner about 7 o'clock. About 10 o'clock, she'll get up, wake up, go to bed. Uh, amen. But uh, uh, I, I was watching this thing, and I can't remember what it was. I, I, it's not important. Like I say, I was napping. But I remember this because from my high school days, I didn't have to take this when I was in college, but from my high school days, I remember in science talking about a perpetual energy machine or something that would create perpetual energy. 
Amen? Do you know if you could create something that would produce perpetual energy, not having to have anything to sustain its continual reference of output? I told somebody this evening, Brother Ken's one of the smartest men I know and electronically and uh, uh, that kind of thing and actually in any other area you want to talk about, he's a very sharp young man. Uh, uh, and uh, you know what would happen if I could create a perpetual energy machine that would produce just a small amount more than what it used to run? Not having to put in anything, but that perpetual energy generating itself and actually giving a positive outcome, given time, there would be no energy problem. If we could get more out than we put in. This says, listen to this, hallow be thy name. Amen? When God spoke into existence this creation, he was a holy God. Without fault, without sin. As he organized uh, uh, I think in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God uh, said, let there be light. God spoke into existence the materials, and then in the seven days, he arranged it and put it in place. The moment that we began to see God was holy, when he was doing all this creation, you understand his handiwork was guarded by holiness. He didn't do anything wrong with it. There wasn't any mistakes made. There wasn't anything left that would lend itself to evil or weakness or failure. And there still is it. This word be means that it, has a, that it has a perpetual action. Do you know when, oh, I got to finish this. When Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation, that the devil came to him and tempted him three times. And in each case, Jesus refers the devil back to God. Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that precedeth out of the mouth of God. How can that be possible? Because God's word is perpetually holy. Amen. The devil has no answer for the perpetual holiness of God. Amen. And each time that the devil tempted Jesus, he referred him back to who God's holiness is. Amen. So it says this. It says, uh, 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 hallow be thy name. The same holy God in the infinite holiness that he is was in the beginning and we'll be at the end, and we'll be for all eternity, Amen. without change. The same today, yesterday, and forever. You ever read that and listen to it? The same, without change at all. Amen? We are so used, and, and honestly, we as people can't always comprehend that, because we change so much. Uh, Brother uh, you, Hastings and I were today uh, working on his truck, or his vehicle. He's got a mechanical problem with his Lincoln, and... Uh, uh, I kept uh, looking down, and, every, and, and he can tell you, I cut myself, what, three or four times down there. And every time I looked down, I finally got me a, a paper towel and carried it around so I could blop up the blood. And I've got it all cleaned up right now, but I didn't even know where I was cut. But I told him, you know, I looked down at these hands. I don't recognize them. They're not young. They're not, they're not 30 years old or 25 years old. They've aged. I would say they look like my father's hands, but he never lived to be 74. Uh, so I know that they're worse than his. Uh, and I look at these hands and I think, my, how they've changed. The other day I walked through my bathroom and I, uh, I just finished shaving and I raised up and I was putting on some aftershave. If you're like me, I look. Uh, I don't just <laughs> obey her because it gets in your eyes or something. But I'm looking and I thought, my goodness, who is that old fella? It's changing. God has never, ever, ever, not one iota, not one eyelash, not one hair ever changed. His holiness is exactly as it was when he himself stepped in to time and eternity by the creation. Amen. So when we pray, we ought to realize first that we are coming uh, before him that is the creator, but we're coming before him that is holy. Is that important? Yes, because that's what's securing me in his grace. And that's what I have in him is holiness. Holiness that's not mine. It's his. So when, he, when the apostle says, pray after this manner, therefore pray ye, uh, your, our Father which are in heaven, hallow be thy name. Praise God, he's holy. Because that's what he's offering to me. He has redeemed me from sin and made me to be comfortable in his perpetual holiness. Well, thank you so much for tuning this in tonight. 
Uh, if you'll stand, we'll have a word of prayer together and we'll go ahead and let them turn the uh, recording off up there.